I'll get started. Um, so this is my first time ever in Gothenburg and my first time speaking at FOSS North. Thank you so much to Johan for inviting me. And thank you so much to all of you for being here and joining me. A little bit about me first. My name is Anna. Um, I'm originally from Germany, but I now live in London in the UK. Um, I have a little bit of a tra non-traditional background. I studied English and Catholic theology in college because I wanted to become a teacher. Um, some of you may have identified William Shakespeare and Pope Francis on my slide. But about five years ago, I got involved in Python and in the Django communities. Um, and I really like working at the intersection of code and people. So I currently work on the community team of Elastic. Uh, we also have a booth in the expo hall and we have some really cool swag and swag bags. So if you want to step by um, afterwards, that would be really cool. Um, I'm also involved in a few other tech related things outside of work. I'm on the Python Software Foundation Board of Directors, for example. And I also run the Pi Ladies London meetup. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that I am actually affected by mental illness. I struggle with depression and anxiety, and you may wonder why is she mentioning this right now. I'm doing this for a reason, because I think that mental illness is still something we don't talk about enough, especially in tech. And so I try to talk, talk about it really openly in order to normalize the topic. But today I'm here to talk to you about flourishing flaws and making your open source project successful. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Tom Christie, who's the creator of Django REST framework. Um, a lot of what I've learned about open source is from my time working as a community and operations manager for Django REST framework. Before I start, I would like to first do a small informal survey. Who of you contribute to open source? Yay, that's a lot of you, cool. Who of you are open source project maintainers? Okay, still quite a few hands. And who of you have not contributed to open source yet, but are thinking about it? Okay, also a few, cool. Um, today, this talk actually isn't about me. I wanted to wrap it all into a story. So today, I'm going to be talking about two ladies called Grace and Ada. Um, they both work for a software company with an open source business model. They work on the same team. Ada is a self-taught software engineer who's been working in the field for three years. Grace has been working in the field for five years. And she started her own open source project about a year and a half ago. But as you will see throughout this talk, her project could use some help. Um, today, Grace and Ada have a conversation in the office. Their company recently launched a program which lets employees donate money to open source projects of their choice. Um, and this starts a conversation between the two women about open source in general. Grace and Ada brainstorm a couple of open source projects that they know. They come up, for example, with Python, Django, Beware, and Elasticsearch. Um, Grace isn't super sure what open source code really is, so she asks Ada to explain it to her, and Ada explains that open source basically means that code is publicly accessible, it is reusable, and it is modifiable. Ada also says that when most of us think of open source, we think of code, but actually there is much more to it um, than just code. You need all these components, which you can see on my slide, actually, at least I believe so, in order to run a successful open source project, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, Let's start with the other M word, money. Um, so Grace wonders why so many open source projects struggle with funding, although the tech industry, as we all know, is in general very wealthy. Um, and I think the biggest problem is that people don't understand that it's about giving back and also giving forward. So by contributing to open source, either with um, physical resources just such as contributing code or with monetary resources, giving back financially, you also give forward. If you think about open source projects that you use for work, I'm sure all of you use some open source project. Think about if the project stopped being maintained, they wouldn't request 
any, they wouldn't accept any pull requests anymore, your tickets and issues wouldn't get worked on, that would eventually become a huge problem. And I think that is something that a lot of us don't um, recognize. But also what I want to point out is that a lot of people think that you can just ask for money and it just doesn't work that way. You actually have to give people something valuable in return. So the project that I mentioned, uh, Django REST framework, which I worked for, Tom Christie built this sustainable um, giving money um, model where people would give between 15 and $400 a month and they would get certain perks for it, like advertisement or special support or something like that. And the reason that I believe that monthly models like that work really well is that they kind of sustain um, the financial support, whereas um, one-time donations are not as sustainable. So Grace says that she um, implemented this new feature and you sometimes may see people um, asking on Twitter for Patreon donations. If you don't know, Patreon is a basically a fundraising tool, I would say. And she says she recently implemented this feature but and then she thought this would be a good time to ask people for money, but no one ever uh, donated anything to her. And Ada kind of smiles about it and she explains to Grace um, if she has asked those open source contributors of the feature that she implemented is actually useful to them. So I found this tweet about a year ago, and I, it is a bit aggressive, but I think um, the point comes through, so I do want to read it in case there are some people on here who have visual impairments and cannot, cannot see my slide. Um, users don't hate change. Users hate when you take control from them. Users hate when your change shows no value for them. Users hate when they've invested in learning your design and only for you to disregard that investment. Users don't hate change, it's you, not them. Um, so yeah, basically you need to give people something valuable in return, listen to them, don't just make any changes that um, are not useful. Okay. It's also important to establish good communication systems to keep people informed. Um, they are especially important if you want to cultivate new contributors. They will eventually need a way for you to reach out, for, the, for them to reach out to you or for you to reach out to them. There's nothing more frustrating when you're trying to contribute or trying to get started with a new open source project and you're struggling and there's no way for you to get help. Um, so there's certain ways you can do that. You can have a Slack channel, you can have a special um, hashtag on Twitter, you can respond to GitHub issues, you can respond on Discuss, you can even respond on IRC. Um, just keep in mind that IRC is actually really hard to use for coding beginners. I remember when I started coding and just installing IRC was a huge struggle for me. And I think that's something that a lot of us don't realize. Um, something I do want to point out is that it's important that you engage with people via the means they choose to engage with you. So if someone reaches out to you on Twitter, get back to them on Twitter, don't get back to them via email, for example. Also something that um, we don't do enough is thanking people. So if you think about it, has someone ever thanked you for making an open source contribution? Um, who of you have gotten a thank you? Okay, that's quite a few, but I think in general we can just be better about being kind to each other and saying thank you. Um, and I think it makes sense to thank all the people that contribute to an open source project, not just the people who write code. Thank them, uh, th thank the people who do your social media, who are community managers, thank them in your release notes, send them a happiness packet. Mikey Ariel gave a wonderful talk this morning. Um, it was the uh, docs or it didn't happen talk. And she's one of the creators of the happiness packets. And it's a wonderful tool um, where you can send little messages to people to just say thank you to them. I try to send a couple every Friday, every Friday end my week by sending five or so happiness packets. I send them to people who've made my week better or who I just want to cheer up. And I promise it'll make you happy too by spreading happiness to other people. 
Um, in the middle of the conversation, Grace gets an email notification from GitHub. Someone is having trouble um, installing the open source, so open source software that she pushed out. Um, and she's kind of frustrated because she thinks that her documentation is really good, and, but she admits that she gets emails like that quite often. So Ada asks if she can see the documentation. And it looks something like this. Step one, run this command. Step two, some magic happening in between. And step three, the software should work work now. Um, you may laugh now, but I've actually stumbled across a lot of documentation that looks like this. We often forget um, a ton of steps in the middle, and then Ada pulls up this image on her phone. I think it's really brilliant. It says how to draw an owl. Draw some circles and then draw the rest of the owl. Um, it is quite funny, but if you think about someone who's maybe just starting an open source or isn't familiar, is even a coder but not familiar with this one certain project, they will struggle and if your documentation is bad, then people will move on to a different project. I think if you need more than 30 minutes to figure out how to install something, it's very unlikely that people will stick with it. Um, yeah, Ada. Grace defends herself, as we all do sometimes. Um, when you write documentation, maybe even include some GIFs or some pictures, screenshots. I think any visuals are super um, helpful. We're all different kinds of learners. I'm, for example, a very visual learner. For me, there's nothing better than watching a YouTube video of someone actually typing the code. Um, and something that we also should consider is this is a great opportunity for Grace to actually get help with her documentation. The best the best way to get help with your documentation is to ask someone who's struggling and who's figuring out how to install something to update the documentation and make it better and to write down step by step what they've been doing. And it's kind of a win-win situation because at the same time, you also maybe encourage them to make their very, very own, uh, very first contribution to an open source project, which is really cool. Uh, and then a side note, open source contributions do not have to be code patches. My first ever contribution was just going going through the Django Girls tutorial. Django Girls is an organization which teaches women how to code by helping them build a blog. Um, and I just went through the tutorial and I corrected grammar and punctuation mistakes because I'm an English major. So that's kind of my jam. Um, and you may think this is not important, but it actually is because it made the tutorial easier to read for everyone. And in return, it helped me get over that fear of making my first ever open source contribution. Um, and Grace mentions that she looked at this person's GitHub profile and she notices this person is a beginner. And I think that we often catch ourselves thinking that, we, oh, this is a beginner, it would be too much work to actually help them. Um, if you think about it, that thought probably has crossed your mind too. Um, but mentorship doesn't need to take a ton of time. Um, mentorship, can, you can set aside an hour to a week. All of us have that time, and mentorship is actually super rewarding. So I do encourage you that if you um, contribute to open source or you maintain an open source project, try to cultivate the next generation of open source project contributors and maintainers, because the reality is if we don't try to make open source sustainable right now, we will at some point run into problems because none of us live forever. So we need to kind of cultivate the next generation of open source contributors. Also, I think something we take for granted is that open source projects need contributors from people of contributions from people of all skill levels and expertise. Um, as I said, this is just a um, small exercise if you're interested. I thought it was kind of cool. Um, if you want to see what your first ever PR was, go to this website, firstpr.me, and you can see what it was. I found it kind of cool to see what I did. Um, talked about that. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, Okay, 
So Grace and Ada continue the contribution by Ada being a little, the conversation by Ada being a little bit um, frustrated because she sees that projects like Elasticsearch have way over a thousand contributors and her, her project has very little contributors. So she wonders why that is and why not more people contribute to her open source project. And then um, Grace, um, Ada brings up if Ada ever does something to actually promote her project. Maybe you're in the same situation you have this great pot project, you have great code, um, but no one knows about your project. Um, Grace mentions that she tweets about it sometimes, maybe like once a month, um, like some of us do, but that's often not enough. You actually need to market your open source project. You need incentives for people. We at Elastic, we give um, these cool pins to our community organizers. I have one in my backpack and people stop me all the time and they see the pin and they want one too. And then I tell them, yeah, you can have one if you become a community organizer. So it can be something very small like this. These pins does, don't cost us a lot of money, but people really appreciate them. Or give them special stickers. We all love our stickers in the tech community and printing stickers is so cheap. So that's a good way to incentivize people to contribute to your open source project. And besides social media, your project also needs a website, including a blog. Um, it needs a mailing list, and it needs people to evangelize, talk about it, at conferences, run hackathons, mentor people, and so on. Um, Grace says that she's not really good at social media. Um, and Ada says that there are people in the community who may be good at social media. This is what I meant, that contributions to open source don't have to involve code, and we need people of all expertise levels. Everyone has different talents. If you look at this little gopher superwoman, for example, there's a woman in the Microsoft community called Ashley McNamara. She's a developer evangelist, but she's also a very talented artist, and she uh, created a website called gopherize.me, where you can create a little gopher version of yourself. And this has nothing to do with code per se, but people love stickers, people love fun little things. So she uses her talent to bring something else to open source. Um, and while Ada and Grace get a quick coffee break and I get a little sip of water, I want you to take maybe 10, 20 seconds to think about or write down one individual talent other than coding, which you can use to contribute to open source. So maybe just think about it for 10 seconds. Besides diversity of talent, something we take for granted is diversity of contributors. It matters. And by diversity, I mean more than just women. We need people of different ethnicities, we need people of different age groups, of different sexual orientations, and of different educational backgrounds. All of us bring something new to open source. Um, Grace shares with Ada that she sometimes struggles with assigning tasks to people who offer to help. I think that task distribution is a huge problem, and I think that another problem is that people, I sometimes describe people in open source like Gollum, the little creature from Lord of the Rings. I think we can be very like, this is mine. I don't want other people to contribute to this. Um, maybe this is funny, but I've, I've experienced it a lot. Um, so I do recommend that you assign roles to people who reach out and who want to help and give them ownership. Like the uh, most successful thing I've seen done in open source or really in project management in general is to give people jobs. Maybe have a social media manager, have a community manager, have someone who, simp who um, is the owner of ticket triage. It makes your life easier and it give makes the person feel special because they are the owner of a certain area of your open source project. So Grace, for example, struggles with ticket triage. So it would be uh, really important for her to find someone like that. And ticket triage is actually something really important that a lot of us don't want to do or don't like to do. But if tickets weren't assessed by... Um, urgency and difficulty or assigned labels, they would never get worked on. 
Also, I think it's important to learn to say no. Um, when you see a new issue, for example, consider this is something viable that you will be working on in the new future. If you see an issue and you already know that it's not something you will be fixing on in the next six months, close it better than to clutter up your repository with a bunch of issues that you never will work on anyway. Um, uh, bugs are a little bit different, but um, if you know that you won't be working on a bug anytime soon, maybe close it as a known limitation and document it. Grace shares with Ada that she thinks she doesn't always do a good job communicating with people. So Ada suggests that she um, engages and finds a community manager. Community is something that I work on full time. Our team at Elastic, I think, is about 20 people all over the world just working on community. So you can see that community is something that's really important to us. And I think community is important to open source in general. Um, this is Brett Cannon. He's one of the core contributors to Python, and he can came up with this wonderful quote, which I really love. He says, I came for the language, but I stayed for the community. And that's true for me as well. I haven't, I honestly haven't written a line of Python in probably like three years or so, but I'm still super involved in the Python community because to me, it's like family. I, had a lot, I have a lot of friends there. So I think it's important to cultivate these social relationships. Um, and Grace is scrolling, th scrolling through Twitter as she's having the conversation with Ada and she sees that there's another heated discussion about a code of conduct um, like we see most weeks, sadly. And the common misconception is that you don't need a code of conduct for your um, open source project. Grace, for example, says nothing has ever happened. People are nice to each other. But what people don't realize is that you need to have a code of conduct in place before something happens, just in case something happens. Um, by actually not having a COC you will lose contributors because people don't feel safe. If they don't know if you will do something, if they get harassed, they just don't want to take the risk of being involved in your open source project. Um, there is a um, code of conduct that I would recommend. It's called the Contributor Covenant. You can see the website here. It's completely free. It's been written by Coraline Ada, um, who's really big in open source in the Ruby community. Um, and it's completely free. You can implement it today. So if, you if your open source project does not have a code of conduct, please do me a favor and implement one today. But also, you need to be willing to enforce your code of conduct. It is not enough to just have this document written and down there, if someone comes to you and they're being harassed, you need to be able to call people out for bad behavior. Um, all right, so to sum up everything I've talked about, um, things that I recommend in order to make your open source project successful. Listen to your contributors and be responsive. Offer your financial supporters something valuable in return if you have financial supporters. Establish good communication systems. Thank all contributors of your project, not just those who write code. Uh, write thorough documentation, including screenshots and GIFs. Acknowledge all contribu contributions as equally important. Um, find contributors of all skill levels and expertise. Offer mentorship. Provide contribution incentives. Work on marketing, including a website and a blog, an active Twitter account, a mailing list, and evangelism. Recognize the importance of diversity of contributors and talents, and give contributors ownership. Um, learn to say no to bugs and issues you won't fix in the next six months. Instead, document them. Nurture your community. And last but not least, add a code of conduct and be willing to enforce it. Um, Grace and Ada aren't specific people. All of us could be Grace and Ada. Maybe some of us have struggled with some of the things that Grace has struggled with, and maybe some of us helped others like Ada's helping Grace. I hope that you take some of these tips and tricks to heart and maybe consider implementing one thing or another into um, your open source project. Most of all, I hope that we can all learn to be a little kinder to each other as open source project maintainers, as contributors and users, as developers, and as humans. One of my favorite quotes is that everyone that you meet fights a battle you know nothing about. So be kind always. Um, 
I won't be taking questions on stage because I'm actually really afraid of Q&A because it's something I can't prepare for. Um, so that's all I have for you today. I will be around at my booth, um, right around the corner at the Elastic booth. So if you have any questions, feedback, comments, please come see me there. You can also follow me on, tw on Twitter. I'm at OSSAnna16. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of Foss, Foss North, enjoy beautiful Gothenburg, and have a wonderful afternoon and have a wonderful afternoon break. Thank you so much for listening.